Great. OK, uh, so uh, good day to you all. And uh, I'd like to say thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation today. And I hope you're keeping a well amidst all of the madness. So uh, this presentation is about my research into developing a natural language processing pipeline for hostile narrative analysis. So unique to this pipeline when compared to others is our use of qualitative methods. And so whilst my presentation is focused on, uh, on my research, I'll try to keep the points generally applicable uh, for RSC uh, discussion points that uh, we'd uh, be very happy to take up with afterwards. And you can see my contact details on the slide. So my motivation for this research is a keen interest in humanity's relationship with violence, which has developed over a 20 year career in the British Army, both as a regular and reservist, three years working for IBM with UK police and about four years working in and around anti-slavery. So within the social side of the socio-technical paradigm, my interests are in theories of violence from peace research, which form the basis of the PhD. On the technical side, I'm interested in the use of technology to develop ideas from peace research that explore our relationship with violence. And as such, over the last couple of years, I've been uh, teaching myself how to code. So, um, you know, so unifying these interests is the emerging field of peace tech that employs technology to assist with tackling the drivers of conflicts, promote stability and build peace. So um, as a socio-technical discipline, the PhD in web science, which I'm currently engaged with, has been an ideal forum to unite all of these interests. And I've got about a year to go before, uh, fingers crossed, graduating as a, as a PhD. So as many of you will be detecting, I'm of a certain vintage. And as someone who's developing code for that research, I now find myself becoming a research software engineer. And I think for people of my vintage who are making a career change uh, into innovation and te technology, much as I am, uh, to be research on uh, software engineer, I think is a really good uh, way forward. So I'm really pleased to be given the opportunity to present to you all today. So as I said, uh, guided by theories of violence from peace research, uh, my PhD uh, is, is about proposing a natural language processing pipeline for hostile, na excuse me, hostile narrative analysis. So as we know, social volatility and the proliferation of web technologies has led to an increased awareness of online abuse. So in response, a new industry of hate speech detection using NLP has emerged and there's quite a lot of money floating around in this industry. Yet a 2019 review of the industry by the Alan Turing Institute finds there are a number of challenges, not least around some of the theoretical and method methodological approaches. And I'll touch some of, uh, on those uh, later in the presentation. So I'm going to hopefully address these problems by proposing hostile narrative analysis as a new approach. And then you'll, you'll throughout the presentation, I hope you'll see why that is valid. So in the presentation, I'm going to take you through what we mean by analysing a hostile narrative with NLP and using qualitative method. So by hostile narrative, we mean a narrative produced by an orator who intends to legitimise violence against another person or another group. So guiding design of the um, pipeline is the theory of cultural violence from peace research, which seeks to understand the processes of violence legitimisation. And I'll go on, on to this uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. And pictured here is Johan Galtung, who is a pioneer of peace research and first proposed this theory. So to define the process of analysing a hostile narrative, we've proposed a novel methodology for detecting and measuring cultural violence in natural language. And then this methodology provides a framework for the proposed uh, pipeline and of course this PhD research as well. And it's that kind of format we're going to go through in the presentation. So to the best of our knowledge, this research constitutes the first attempt to use cultural violence for designing and developing an NLP pipeline. And uh, with this socio-technical approach, uh, I, well, this socio-technical approach, I think, is a really good discussion points for research software engineers, since it is about understanding technologies through the technological interactions with sociological theory. So we may be able to recall a project where a, a very sophisticated algorithm has been developed, and then the developer goes looking for a problem to solve. With a socio-technical approach, however, we begin with a problem, and then we de design a uh, derive a theoretical framework to define that problem and then develop technology to best address that problem. And then in its ongoing management, we look at how the theory and the technology actually interact. So we now begin uh, 
by looking at, first of all, detecting what is the problem with existing NLP technologies, to actually, uh, which begins with this problem of there not being um, a formal definition of hate speech anywhere. So first of all, if you take a look at this picture, I'd like you to consider whether this image and statement about the Member of Parliament, uh, Diane Abbott, is hateful. So will we in person, I'd ask you to raise your hand. Now for the international audience, Diane Abbott is a Labour Member of Parliament who's, who has most certainly received an unacceptable level of online abuse in recent times. So just consider for a moment where do you think this picture and statement are abusive. So while many usually agree that this image and headline are abusive, the actual headline is about the uh, is not about Diane Abbott. It is actually about the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. So it is a the headline for a news ask, paper article by Peter Oburn in the Daily Mirror. So were we in person, I would now ask you to raise your think about this image and raise your hand if you still think it is abusive. So when delivering an early version of this uh, of this presentation in face to face, uh, the room regarded the headline and image against Diane Abbott to be abusive, but the same against Boris Johnson to not be so. So what you can see here is we don't actually have any kind of formal way of defining what is hateful or abusive speech. It's a highly subjective task. And there isn't actually a, 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 any general theory of hate speech that has received a sufficiently broad consensus in the research community. So without this kind of accepted definition of hate speech, there is also not a data set to actually define the computational task of its detection in natural language. So it is in light of the definitional problem, therefore, that we switch to the idea of hostile narrative, which using theories of violence can uh, takes us more towards an objective uh, definition. And we'll sort of see how that manifests uh, throughout the presentation. So as representations of hostile narratives, we created a data set comprising Hitler's Mein Kampf, along with political speeches from George Bush and Osama bin Laden during the war on terror. And for, for experimenta experimentation purposes in how we adv advocated for non-violent speeches from Martin, Martin Luther King provide control data. So as the slide states, we're not suggesting any moral equivalence between any of these orators. Instead, we're exploring the functional equivalence in language that each use to legitimize violence. So uh, of course, apart from Martin Luther King, each has successfully brought about dramatic change using violence that was advocated in their speeches. But in the case of Martin Luther King, of course, he advocated for nonviolent means. So having such extremes in the data sets means we, we can assess experimental results through observation, which would hopefully give uh, stark results. So we know the intention of each orator, that is generally accepted, and we know who each, who each they were and were not seeking to legitimise violence against. But so having a, for, a, so over the last couple of years, we conducted a whole bunch of experiments on this data set using NLP technologies. And I'll summarise one of those uh, experiments now, which then sort of reveals the problem, uh, which the, suggests the limits of AI systems between um, subjectively and objectively defined tasks. So of all the experiments conducted, um, well, all the experiments conducted are available in the GitHub repo that uh, are here. So they're published in open source and you're very welcome to go and have a look at those. And for this first one, I'm going to take going to give you a look at sentiment analysis. So we tested three sentiment analysis algorithms. The first is text blob, and this is an open source Python, Python library that uses word scores to determine sentiment. So as, as, uh, each word in a sentence is ascribed with a score and then an average of those um, scores is taken to determine the sentiment of that sentence. So it's fairly straightforward. But as state of the art, we tested APIs from Google and Watson. So while the text blob provides documentation for how its API works, I wasn't able to find the same for Google or Watson. So for those who don't know, sentiment analysis seeks to make a determination of positivity where uh, plus one is the highest level of positivity. And as you might expect, uh, minus one is the highest level for negativity and zero is neutral. But notice how in this kind of uh, scoring framework, there isn't actually a unit of measurement, which I'm sure goes against many scientific principles. And on the axis of the table here, you will skip, you'll see the, the sort of the entries for each of the APIs that were tested. Then the emotion scores for sadness, joy, fear, disgust and anger are provided by the Watson uh, API. 
And we'll now go through some of the sort of quite stark sentences from uh, Mein Kampf and Martin Luther King's statements to show uh, some of the findings of our sentiment analysis. analysis. <laughs> so in this first sentence from Mein Kampf, Hitler uses an analogy of racial poisoning for immigration. So he regards those who are racially pure to be in his in-group and those who might infect that purity as an out-group. So he's using a medical analogy to describe the problem of immigration. So this is a highly offensive statement, yet receives a remarkably high score from Watson. And I should say, these are some of the more tame sentences from Mein Kampf uh, that I've picked out for the purpose of this presentation. And some of the more tame sentences that actually received positive scores. So in this second sentence, uh, Hitler declares the swastika to be a symbol of the Aryan struggle, uh, which is anti-Semitic. So this is a very hostile statement towards Jewish people, yet Google scores it with a positive sentiment score of 0.3. But then also if we go to the emotion scores that are provided by Watson, we actually see that it has similar scores for both sadness and joy. So the same sentence is receiving what will probably be contradictory results for emotion. So this third sentence is the essential premise of racism in that uh, Hitler encourages a state to dedicate itself to its best racial elements by protecting them from blood poisoning, which is that uh, analogy he used for immigration. So where the statement uh, receives plus, plus one, which has no high score um, from text blob, it does receive negative scores from Google and Watson, but not hugely negative scores. But then if we go over to the emotion, we actually, the highest score that Watson scores it is with for joy. So it determines this to be both a negative and joyful statement. So then as in our control data, uh, we have one of the I have a dream statements from uh, Martin Luther King. So this is taken from his I have a dream speech, which uh, I, I don't need to say to anybody here is kind of an iconic speech that resonates with positivity throughout history. And in that speech, there are six statements where he says, I have a dream. And they, these, I think we could reasonably regard those as positive. Yet all three APIs uh, remark, have scored this particular sentence as negative. Uh, but then of particular interest in the way that TextBob works, it scores the noun phrase little black boys negatively, whilst little white boys is scored neutrally. And this is because the word black attracts a negative score of 0 0.17, whereas the word white attracts a score of zero. So that means any term that contains the word black will be scored negatively compared to any other color. And I probably don't need to go into uh, what that actually means uh, for analyzing, for analyzing um, sentiments here. So where we face to face, we might now discuss what these results mean and of course, we're going to have disagreement. Yet, what is our assessment framework for analysing sentiment that moderates our differences in agreement? We, we can't get access to any of the documentation to figure out how all this works. And in particular, as I said before, there's no actual unit of measurement to define any of these numerical outputs. So with much to discuss, I'll happily take questions in the Q&A or please do follow up with me afterwards and we can go through it further. But what we might agree upon for now is that for a data set comprising extremes of sentiment and APIs of extremes and te technical sophistication, these results are highly ambiguous. And what I'd like, now like you to draw your attention to are the more technical aspects of the system's architecture. So in the absence of being able to assess the architecture of Google and Watson, I've just taken a generic um, system architecture from uh, the uh, from the textbook that you can see referenced here, and I'm sure many of you will be familiar with it. And this is pretty much the architecture that's used in NLP. So for sentiment analysis and hate speech detection, the reference data set is generally created from uh, user annotations. So data from a particular source, often so social media, is downloaded, then annotators annotate that data set based on some sort of coding schema. And then this coding schema forms the basis for training the algorithm. And I've been part of this process uh, in a project for the Alan Turing Institute. But what we have here is a model uh, where annotators are making subjective determinations about the data, which, it, which in fact is what the, the intentions of an orator, which are then carried through into the system, which means we actually have the potential to introduce quite a lot of biases 
or annotated bias. So again, there's a lot to discuss here, but the point I'd like to focus on is this. If people can't agree on what constitutes hate speech, then how can we teach machines to do the same? And perhaps of greater interest in the design of technology to detect hate speech, when there's no generally agreed definition for the task, who gets to decide what constitutes abuse? So in this model, it is the annotators who are making that determination. And finally, uh, when we look at how this, this whole system is evaluated, it is generally uh, determined by uh, pre the precision of recall in, in relation to the annotated data set. But how well that generalizes to create meaningful results, as saw in the previous slide, probably isn't uh, always appropriate. So what we might have now is a more general understanding of what AI systems can be created for. Reference data sets are no doubt good for ob ob objective observations, but we must question those that are created for subjective interpretations of things like language. So in the absence of a definition of hate speech, therefore, we're using the theory of cultural violence from peace research for developing the NLP pipeline with a focus on using qualitative methods. So the theory of cultural violence was first proposed by Galtung in a 1990, pa 1990 paper that's referenced on the slide, and it is part of what he calls the conflict triangle. So direct violence refers to physical force, while structural violence refers to less physical experiences of harm derived from pernicious societal structures. So structural violence is more commonly referred to as social injustice. So animating this conflict triangle is the data set I spoke about earlier. So direct violence are, of course, acts of warfare. But for this research, uh, both jihad and the war on terror could be regarded as structural violence. So these are conceptually similar, but of course from different kind of cultures. But each, each features the imposition of structural changes in favour of one group over another. And so the point is that cultural violence is then uh, used to legitimise either direct or structural violence uh, within this framework. And so Galton proposes that cultural violence operates by changing the moral colour of an act from wrong to right, or at least acceptable. So consider that killing another human in defence of your country, such as soldiers do, would be seen as at least acceptable. But in your defence of your house, it would very likely be seen as a criminal act, therefore wrong. So um, Galton argues that this change in perception is created through what he calls the self other gradient. So the self of the gradient refers to how an orator may elevate their chosen people and other those deemed lower down a scale of worthiness. So in this slide, you're going to see several statements from both Bush's and Bernardo's speeches that are used for elevation and othering. And I'd like you to particularly notice how we're using qualitative uh, data, so i.e. the relevant statements from each speech, as evidence and explanation for elevation and othering. So we've got some elevation phrases here. And with the phrase, God bless America, George Bush uses religion as an, uh, to elevate his in-group of America with a divine status. And we also see Bin Laden doing the same, uh, using Allah as sort of his religious deity to, uh, to elevate his target with a divine status. But then also on the right hand side, we see uh, another religious concept of evil. Uh, is being used in a noun phrase, axis of evil, that Bush is using to collectively other his outgroup of Iran, Iraq and North Korea. So drawing upon social psychology, we refer to the self as an orator's in-group and the other as their outgroup, with the distance between each known as intergroup differentiation. So the general hypothesis we're working to here uh, is that the greater the differentiation between groups created by the self or the gradient, the more legitimate violent acts against the outgroup uh, become. So now let us move to the net methodology we've developed that is derived from this, theor this theoretical framework and is used to actually extract a lot of these statements that are used for elevation and othering. So derived from the theory of cultural violence and led by the data set, we're proposing this fo following methodology for analysing hostile narratives by measuring the self or the gradient. So measuring this gradient firstly means marking up the linguistic re representations of named entities, religion and ideology in a text by using named, context, named concept recognition. And we'll go through this in the next couple of slides. So the lexical relationship between each of these entities and concepts is then used to extract feature phrases, which you saw in the previous slide, 
which contain elevation and othering statements. So finally, these phrases become the qualitative units of measurement uh, to infer the self other gradient. So in summary, this methodology mimics the process of qualitative coding with a structured approach. So four objectives and then sub-objectives uh, define this structure. And then we've, uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, reproducible experiments, which are published in the GitHub repo I mentioned earlier, to actually try and fulfill each of these uh, objectives and have been developing the code to do so. So for developing the pipeline, we've been using the Spacey NLP Python library, which I thoroughly recommend to anyone. And I've picked this up and I've started using it within two years uh, of uh, for, that's from a standing start. And, and that's because it's so well designed. So you'll see the pipeline, the sort of the, the, the pipeline representation at the top of this slide. So in short, the pipeline comprises several kind of components, which are class objects, and these components uh, are out of the box and these meet some of the method methodological requirements. So in short, the, the user inputs text as natural language, then Spacey outputs a doc object, uh, which is that text in uh, process. So many of you will have used the NLTK library that generally speaking analyzes text as a bag of words. Spacey, on the other hand, takes an object oriented approach, which I found particularly useful for annotating different bits of text and then drawing analysis from that. So Spacey also allows the inclusion of custom components, and that's essentially what we've been developing as part of the research. And here you can see an example of hyper the hyperbole custom component that I'll refer to in the next couple of slides. And as this has been published in open source, this custom component has actually been used by another pipeline called SciSpacey that analyzes uh, medical texts. So, um, so the safe, as I said, the, the Spacey software library provides out of the box named recognition and, con and noun chunking. And we've had to modify a, a, a couple of those just particularly for the, the specific ideas and language that are in Bin Laden's text. Uh, and as is the case with most NLP projects, this pre-processing step has been by far the most time consuming. And as part of this uh, pre-processing objective, we've also been doing named concept recognition that has been developed using a theory driven schema, uh, you, from a, uh, which is taken from an idea put forward by Mike Martin in the book, Why We Fight. So in this book, he talks about the five group problems that sort of are attributes of any kind of social group. So he argues that any group of any size must solve each of these five problems shown here for successful group living. So we use these, com these problems as a theoretical framework to categorize synonymous terms that represent concepts from different group ideologies. And they're going to see how this works um, in the next couple of slides. So to develop this schema, we coded Bush and Bin Laden's data set to categorize synonymous terms by each of these group attributes. So for example, we've got the identity attribute at the top in which we have the word enemy. And the word enemy uh, is synonymous with invade and occupier, and that is found within the uh, military ideology. So, and we'll see how, as I said, we'll see how the schema works as we now go through the methodology. So for objective one, we've got detecting the in-groups and out-groups of a text. So to do this, we use the lexical relationships between out-group and in-group terms and named entities. So considering the following feature phrase from Bush's address to the joint sessions of Congress following the 9-11 attacks. And this is a phrase in which his out-groups are kind of positively identified. So the leadership of Al-Qaeda has great influence in Afghanistan that supports the Taliban regime in controlling most of that country. So as you can see from the dependency paths in this, uh, in this slide, the geopolitical outterm of regime is positively associated with the named entity Taliban, and that's through its compound relationship. So then we can infer that the Taliban um, is an outgroup of George Bush. But while we also know that Al-Qaeda is one of these outgroups, there is no equivalent noun phrase term in this sentence. So this second sentence positively identifies Al-Qaeda through what's known as its hypernomic relationship with terrorist organization. So we've got the, the hyponym term of loosely affiliated terrorist organizations, and we've got a hyponym of Al-Qaeda. And then these are linked through the phrases known as. So what we have is a kind of a subject predicate object relationship uh, between each. So what we and I'll 
uh, hypermini is a big subject, um, and I'll ha very happy to take questions in Q&A or in, in follow-up. So we have two methods for identifying the in-group and out-group of text. The first is to identify relationships at the noun phrase level, such as Taliban regime. And the second is using uh, hypermini through Hearst patterns. So Hearst is, uh, Professor uh, Marty Hearst is the woman who invented sort of the idea of Hearst, Hearst, Hearst patterns and hypermini. Uh, and then so the tests of this component, which I showed earlier, uh, of, of giving us about a 0 0.72 uh, accuracy at present. So having detected the in-group and out-group of narrative, we'll now look at how do we identify the feature phrases that either elevate the in-group or out-group to create this self of the gradient. So for elevation and othering, consider the following feature phrases that are taken from the earlier self of the gradient slide. So we have God bless America. So notice how the named entities through the, and so we have the, the actual sentence uh, at the top and then the bullet point is how that sentence is represented using terms from that group schema. So notice how they generalize the concepts that each represent. So for this pattern, the deity could be any God that people choose to follow. Still, the actual intention of the sentence and how it function remains consistent. So, and then next we've got in this, uh, we can see how George Bush elevates his in-group of fellow Americans uh, by describing with sort of benevolent terms of generosity, kindness, resourcefulness, and bravery. And then we switch to some out-group phrases. So by aiding abetting murder, the Taliban regime is committing murder. So here we can see how he's positively associating the Taliban regime with sort of criminal violence uh, as a means to other them. Uh, and again, using criminal ideology, we see uh, how he is uh, sort of posit positively associating uh, Al-Qaeda or uh, othering Al-Qaeda with those criminal um, ideas. So by detecting the dependency relationship between the named entities and concepts from the group schema, we can determine which phrases elevate the in-group and other the out-group. But overall, notice how in what declarations of war Beyond the military use, use of military concepts, Bush draws upon ranges of ideologies to legitimise his war on terror. And the same is true for bin Laden. So also notice how using the schema to generalise each phrase, we are now detecting language patterns to, for application in contexts other than declarations of war. So the instance of each named entity is less critical to how the concept of an entity relates to other concepts. Hi Steve, sorry, just to uh, just to butt in, you just about hit time there, so uh, yeah. just to let I'm you just know. About to fin yeah, just about to finish up actually. Right, thanks. So um, finally we've got the scoring schema. So in the scoring schema, we um, through coding the through coding the, the, the data set, we sort of revealed um, seven of the of uh, group ideologies that we see here, and I've put some of the outgroup terms that are associated with each. And then what we'll do is look at how um, the use of each of these ideologies can actually uh, invoke kind of senses of severity. So of these, the medical is perhaps the most severe, and we've seen that already uh, with uh, Adolf Hitler's use of racial poisoning to do to describe uh, to describe uh, immigration. And that is something that's a finding that uh, from Mike Martin, where he says that um, because disease control is so um, inherent to groups, successful group living, these medical analogies can be quite pernicious and certainly feature strongly in genocidal narrative. So to conclude, uh, because my time is uh, wrapping up, um, so referring back to our architecture from earlier, we can see how this methodology changes the model. So rather than an annotated data set defining hate speech or cultural violence or whatever subjective task we're looking at, in this model, the reference data set is for linguistic annotations only. So these linguistic annotations with some caveats could be defined reasonably regarded as an objective task. So the use of qualitative methods, it could seem that the annotated data set is no longer required, that removes for bias and actually saves quite a lot of cost of developing these systems. But of course, the rule set of this architecture are those common structures of language that are used to legitimize violence. And these structures, as, you've, as I hope you can see, are derived from a broad range of narratives that you've seen in the presentation. So uh, to finish, um, so I hope to provoke the questions and please do get in touch um, if you'd like to know more. And as a general observation, we might question whether AI can or indeed should be uh, uh, developed to tackle these subjective tasks. Uh, 
And, I, and as you can see, in following the principles of socio-technical science, this research is guided by sociological theory for technical design, which I think is a, a good discussion point for research software engineering, and where Peace Tech aims to reduce the potential for violence. I'm looking forward to seeing how this research can be applied to web technologies to tackle online abuse. Uh, thank you very much.